So plan A is just not having freeways in the first place. Let's call this the Vancouver plan. But if you've built freeways and you can't seem to get rid of them, what about just decking them over? The top 10 freeway lids in the US are up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. Viewer suggestions, always appreciated. And man, I got a lot of requests to talk about this. Like this one from GreenNate12. Any thoughts on capping the freeways? You guys, I have thoughts on everything. I would actually have to clone myself multiple times just to make all the videos I'm interested in making, but trust me, that's just not a dystopia you want to live in. In terms of freeway caps or lids or decks or whatever you want to call them, yeah, I've probably got three or four videos in the pipeline, but I wanted to start with the basics, the kind of what the why and the where. To get at the what, let's first clarify what we're not talking about. We're not just talking about any freeway that has anything over the top of it. Specifically, I'm not talking about tunnels that were constructed as tunnels, whether they're excavated like the Big Dig in Boston or bored like Highway 99 in Seattle. What we are specifically talking about are freeways that were decked over after the fact. And within that, there's a lot of variety. We're gonna look at freeways that were decked over with parks, freeways that were decked over with intense development, which is way more expensive with way more onerous structural requirements. And we're going to look at combinations of parks and development. So why? Why lids? Well, assuming plan A freeway removal isn't politically feasible, here are some reasons why you might consider spending hundreds of millions of dollars to deck over a freeway. One, Urban land is extremely valuable, so creating more of it where it didn't exist before is kind of like a bit of urbanist magic. Two, they usually improve connectivity across what's usually a major barrier. Third, it's more opportunity for green space, which means more habitat and less urban heat island effect. And fourth, they do help mitigate noise and pollution, at least in a localized way. So personally, I'm a bit skeptical. I mean, all the emissions are still happening. It's just a question of where they're going. So I'm not sold at all on building residential right next to freeways much less right on top of them. But let me know your thoughts down in the comments. So with that as a big caveat, here are the things I looked at to determine the 10 freeway lids that made this list. One, size, so total acreage. A bigger cap means more opportunity for development and open space and less nuisance. Two, location, so how central is it? A freeway cap that's downtown stands a lot more chance of a lot more people using it than one that's out in the suburbs. Three, development intensity. Look, I'm skeptical of whether anybody should be spending significant amounts of time within a quarter mile of a freeway, but freeway caps that are engineered to support high rises are just quite a bit more valuable than ones that are only engineered for parks and plazas. And four, how much they contribute to connectivity. So that means just buildings that are constructed over freeways aren't really what I'm after. There needs to be some kind of public benefit. Final note before we get started, I didn't make this an international list because it's kind of a lot of work and I don't know, I need time to binge streaming shows and play video games. But let me know down in the comments if you have good international examples. Okay, I covered the what and the why, so let's get into the where. Number 10 is Foglietta Plaza and the Veterans Memorial Parks in Philadelphia. This lid provides a nice connection over I-95 to Spruce Street Harbor Park and the Delaware River. It's not as central as some of the other prime freeway cap opportunities in Philadelphia, but the improved river access is really nice. Number nine is Terralta Park in San Diego. It's not quite as central as the Philadelphia cap, but it's larger and it clearly has a pretty important role in stitching back together a community that was pretty obviously bulldozed to make room for I-15. You know, anytime you see an urban freeway that's kind of aligned with a legacy grid like this, you can pretty safely assume the backstory is not good. Number eight is a newer one. This is Clyde Warren Park in downtown Dallas. It's a modern urban public space with a lot of programmed events and activities. It does a good job of connecting uptown and downtown, and you've got the M-Line streetcar running through. 
It's kind of a nice space. Eh, you know I'm not a fan of freeways, but I do kind of like the different vintages and urban context of all these different lids. So number seven is another change up. This is the Kansas City Convention Center, which is decked over I-670 downtown. The downtown KC freeway situation gets kind of a lot of shade on this channel because, well, look at it. But I do like a nice convention center freeway lid. A convention center is always kind of a quasi-public space, and this one has pretty good north-south connectivity. For number six, we're going to the suburbs, not just any suburb. This is Mercer Island outside of Seattle. The lid in question is Aubrey Davis Park over I-90, which is huge and provides a lot of connectivity to the neighborhoods to the north. Let's just pause here to admire not only Aubrey Davis Park, but all of the absurdly nice I-90 over for crossings on Mercer Island. There's a ton of history here between the city and the various I-90 freeway improvements and the link line to light rail extension that I think opens up in 2023. I mean, look at it. Do you suppose Mercer Island is particularly affluent or politically well-connected? Leave your guesses down in the comments. Okay, let's go back east for number five. This is Kanawha Plaza in Richmond, Virginia. You've really got two things going on here. The plaza itself, which is a public space with good connectivity. And then you've got kind of a relatively new office building in Plaza. I don't think this is the most aesthetically pleasing example on this list, but I feel like Richmond's getting a lot of utility out of this. Let's move north a bit for number four. This this is the George Washington Bridgehead, and I don't know what you call everything that's going on here. So New Yorkers, help me out. This is I-95 through Washington Heights at the northern tip of Manhattan, and you've got a shopping center, I guess, the GWB Mercado. There's a bus station, and then there are four residential towers, which aren't all in the same lid. But anyway, it's a lot of land use. It's not beautiful, but it is kind of telling that the only place on Manhattan that really strongly resembles a freeway is almost completely decked over. For number three, hey, I went on location. This is the Washington State Convention Center and Freeway Park in downtown Seattle. I combined them because they connect pretty seamlessly. The Convention Center faces north onto Pike Street and Freeway Park connects alongside it and to the south. Freeway Park was built first and is kind of a distinctive 70s brutalist icon, which according to the world's foremost source of factual information is rated as the second best parkour location in the world by the World Freerunning and Parkour Federation. The convention center has more of a 80s hotel atrium thing going on. It's not my absolute favorite, but it is a massive improvement in the walking environment that connects downtown to Capitol Hill. There's been a recent effort to study a big expansion of the lid. I'm not really gonna comment on it because I was actually a consultant on lid i5, but I'll include some links in the description because it is actually super interesting. Honorable mentions are next. Before we get there, just a reminder to take a moment to use the interactive features down below to show appreciation if you do, in fact, appreciate today's video. Also, and I always ask for topic suggestions, but I wanna go a bit further and ask, if you've been with this channel for a while, let me know what other feedback you have. Like, are you tired of polo shirts? Cause I know I am, but the mic doesn't work very well without them. Boring camera backgrounds, 20th century monotype font, or are you afraid of change? Does it make you nervous? Let me know. This is a very, very pro-constructive criticism channel. Doggo. 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 No, no. Doggo. Okay, I hate to call these honorable mentions because these are almost all places we just shouldn't have freeways in the first place, but Mm, these are all interesting. I-285 at Atlanta Hartsfield Jackson, aka world's busiest passenger airport, at least pre-COVID, was decked over so they could add a fifth runway. I-394 in downtown Minneapolis, decked over with huge parking structures, which I don't know how to feel about that and punching above its weight nicely. Fall River, Massachusetts, where City Hall sits right on top of I-95, right downtown. Okay, on to number two. This is I-90 in Boston, where you've got the Prudential Center, Copley Place, 
the Back Bay train station, and just kind of a variety of other land uses. There's not as much public access as I'd want to see, but it's a ton of development in a pretty valuable space. And for number one, we're going to the nation's capital. This is the capital crossing development over I-395, where it emerges from underneath the National Mall. I believe this is the newest lid on the whole list. I understand it was completely financed privately, and it has a mix of office, retail, and residential, and they reconnected a couple streets on the grid as part of the project. It's in the DC kind of no-fly zone, so I can't give you cool aerials but I've got a few street views that I think kind of tell the story. And that's all I've got. Let me know your philosophy on freeway lids down in the comments. Keep leaving me your great topic suggestions and I'll be back with a new installment next week. I'll see you then.